first of all, I want to thank you, the organizers, for inviting me to this conference. And I really found that this is very illuminating and very intense. And last five days were very amazing for me to somehow communicate and listen to all the very nice talk. And with all this, after all these nice, intense talks, I know what is the virtue of the very last speaker. We are almost at the lunch time, so I try to be, be on time, or as quick as possible. <laughs> okay, my name is Bong Jae Kim, and I'm from Gyeongbuk National University of Korea. Okay, so this is overall flow of my talk, because now my subject is strong lucidity, which is also very interesting, but I think it's somewhat debated from all the other subjects in here, so I'm gonna be briefly introduce some issues of strontium lucinate, and I'm gonna explain about the competing magnetism of this system, and somehow how this system become a static one in the compressed pressure space. So let me start with a very brief introduction of this system. So strontium lucinate 214 system look like this. So it usually look like a cuprate, and this is 2D layered terabyte structure. So overall physics coming from the atomic point of view, this is lucidium O6 octahedron, which is forms like a 2D, like a quasi 2D, like a lattice. And the atomic electron occupation can be seen as a D4. This is 4D system, and these four electrons are more or less equally occupied to all the three D2G orbitals in here. The interesting is that this system is not magnetically ordered up to the very low temperature. So it remains at the paramagnetism up down to the 1.5 Kelvin. And at 1.5 Kelvin, this system turns into a superconductor. So the superconducting temperature is very, very low in here. And if there was indications, which I'm going to explain later, that there is a very strong spin fluctuation exists in this system. Actually, this was the dub as the spin to replace superconductor candidate, and the highly possible other parameter was chiral P state, it was. So it was really highly studied by many researchers in the community. So this is the early consensus. So chiral P wave order parameter look like something like this. And in this case, the copper pair spins rotate in plane. So they play in plane, and it forms a triplet pairing. So there was all the very nice stories from the theory point of view you can do somehow manipulating this triplet pairing system. But there was a few the theoretical the expectation, which is the nodeless, which was the denied by some experimental point of view. And also there was also very, very nice stories, which you can expect from the this order parameter with the spin pairing, triplet pairing, but it was all not detected, of course. And there was also this universal strain experiment where TC should change linear with strain because this is a greater period dependent, but this is, as you can see, this is not really linear at all. Actually, the originally, the one very the kind of crucial ingredient which you see this system as a triplet was the, the, night, the night shift experiment. So in here, the spin orientation in conduction electrons somehow the spin oriented due to this external field, so there's a shift of the, this resonance signal. So for the case of a spin triplet, when the spins are the coupled in singlet, singlet pairing, there's a, the signal just vanishes in the, in the case of a spin singlet. But for the strontium lucinate, they expect that this spin triplet scenario is correct, the signal would remain as the same for the superconducting phase. And there was an experiment quite long ago from Minus group, they found this, and this was one of the crucial experiments which shows that this system is the spin triplet. But as you, many of you already know, so quite recently I would say that this experiment was, was done again, and it was found that there's a uh, downshift of this signal, and eventually the first authors of those group, they also rechecked, and it was their fault somehow somehow wrongly identified the nice shift signal in this system. So it was all the, uh, somehow last 30 years of the story. So after this, there was uh, many other evidences that this system is no more spin triplet. And after like 25 or six, it was really confirmed, more or less confirmed that this is no triplet. And somehow all the nice stories 
which you expected from the spin trivial scenario is somehow gone wrong. So now this is a normal case square flag. But still, the continuing, the, now we are really back to the starting point, and they are studying what is the really the order parameter of this system, which is somehow explain all the related experiment of this system. So there are many candidates, and there are also some many more. What I found is that actually in this system, magnetic fluctuation is a really crucial factor, which is somehow gives you the origin of the pairing mechanism. So what we want to know is that maybe we can understand the magnetic the property of the system, which is very crucial to understand all the electronic and the superconducting phenomena of this system. So we dig into the magnetism of this system. So if you see the non-magnetic density of a state, something like this, then as you see, there's a peak around here, which is very close to the forming energy. So you can expect this system somehow is close to the ferromagnetic uh, instability. This also somehow evidence that the 113 companion of this system is in fact is a ferromagnetic metal, and you see this is a, gives a kind of strong sonar-like instability. And of course, this system is metal, so it gives some, something like double exchange-like mechanism to drive this system into a ferromagnetism. And also, this somehow this ferromagnetic spin fluctuation, because this is ferromagnetic, they can promote the spin triplet pairing scenarios of this system. But the antiferromagnetic in this system is also very strong. Actually, it is even more strong. So this is neutron scattering experiment. It shows that there is a very strong peak at Q vector at around 0 0.3 and 0 0.3 in the two-dimensional lattice in two-dimensional Brillouin zone. And this really <laughs> somehow coincides with the forming surface nesting vector in this system. So what people usually think is that somehow promoted by the, this uh, forming surface nesting, you have a very strong uh, antiferromagnetic spin density wave type fluctuation in this system, and somehow this really drives, this is a really main magnetic instability which this system really has. So this uh, also, if you think about the single parallel scenario, because this antiferromagnetic spin fluctuation, they somehow try to promote the spin single parallel uh, scenarios in this system. And while ago, we have studied this system, this system with the DFT, and we can really find out many different J values up to the very large scale. And we really calculate the hydrogen type exchange interaction in this system. And even though this system doesn't have really the three-dimensional three-dimensional hydrogen type interaction at all, but we can see really the interaction in the in-plane because this system is metal, it really, really proceeds to the very long distances. And if you real transform it into this, this uh, system into a Q-vector system, then we can really find the Q-vector which really goes well with this uh, experimentally found Q-vector which corresponds to the 0 0.3 and 0 0.3. So somehow this gave us the confidence that input density functional theory really describes the magnetism of this system very, very well enough. So we are somehow confident that maybe from the FT point of view, we can really study this system, at least for the point of order due to the magnetism. And on top of this, we also studied the anisotropy term with the spin coupling in here, and what we can really express, uh, the, we can really estimate the related terms in this anisotropic term. This was also somehow we compared to the previous with the experimental values, and we are more or less somehow happy with our DPT computation of the magnetic interactions of this system. And now we go into the other study of this system, then we can see, in fact, other than the ferromagnetic and spin density wave type of interaction, there are many other magnetic uh, instabilities. So if you, this is a susceptibility calculation, you can see many peaks which is away from the ferromagnetism <coughs> and spin density wave type of Q-vector too. Also, we can see here, you can see many those. One is the spin density wave, but you can see there is some other signal may come into this place. And there was a scenario, which is the major scenario when they are disputing with the spin triplet and spin singlet scenario. The main competition was they thought was the ferromagnetic versus spin density wave type of interaction. But in a recent study, what they have also found is that in fact there was not even a competition because what you see in here is that 
Fermat fluctuation is very, very small compared to the spinetic wave interaction. Somehow, so it means that maybe it is also kind of a scenario which does not tell you that single, the triplet scenario is really possible from the magnetic point of view. As this system is very close to the magnetic system, you can dope this system with a very, like this is doping of like 1% or 9% of doping, you can derive this system into the other type of magnetism. Also, with calcium, you can derive this system into some other magnetic scenario. So, we, what we see is that, actually, the, as I said, this system is not magnetic. So, this is, system is the paramagnetic system, but very close to magnetism. So, somehow, we can derive this system with doping or something else, then making this system to have a static magnetism. So what we have done is uh, the depth calculation and really totally energetic calculation. But here we employ this uh, generalized block theorem to see the, all the different two vectors of this system. So let me recap some previous uh, work in this system because there is also stoner pheromone instability and like I said, there is a nesting in this spinless wave instability in this system. Also, there were other studies which shows that there should exist some isotropic fluctuation very close to the gamma point two. Also, there is a recent model study which is suggests there could be some interdependent nesting with the Q vector of one half and one quarter, something like that. With this, we really perform DFD energetic calculation with the, employing the general, generalized growth theorem. What we see here first is that we can really see the spinless wave type of the the Q vector has the lowest energy, meaning that this is leading the magnetic instabilities. And it is even much lower than the ferromagnetic one, one in here. There's a very small dip in here, but still, this is much more lower in energy. So th this really is the leading instability of this system. Also, if you see here at around the, form, uh, at around the gamma point, this, is, uh, this dip is very, very broad, see, which is also somehow coincides with the neutron scattering experiment. Also, we can observe other instability which has been reported before, something like this. So we can really see this DFT study really captures from the total energy calculation, can really capture the basic magnetic properties of this system. Maybe I can go through this part a little bit fast. So here we have studied maybe strain can somehow play with these different type of instabilities and we can drive this system into a more spinless wave type or something else, but maybe I will go through this just quickly and I can go into the static magnetism in this system. Actually, the motivation of our work, what has been done quite a while ago in here. So here, there was an experiment which shows that because this is originally C, has a CPO symmetry, so it is a tetragon system, and in their ex experiment from the Max Planck, they have applied compressive strain upon one direction. So they break the C4 to C2, they break the C4 symmetry and making this system into C2. And by the way, of doing that, they have found them the, the, the divergence of the superconductor and time reversal symmetry breaking of this system. And this, is, is this research was not really found from simple hydrostatic pressure and disorder effect. So somehow, this universal strain gives something very interesting in this system. And what we have noticed is that if you apply this system universal stress upon the one direction, eventually you will find the static order in the universal strain sampling here. So let me go over a little bit more on the universal strain experiment because this system is, this experiment looks very powerful because if you see the TC of the system, originally it was 1.5 Kelvin, but if you apply the universal strain, you can obtain the 3.5 Kelvin. Even though the number itself is very low, it's more than twice of the TC, which means that you can really play with the scale of the smoke conducting or the parameter. Also, as this system has a very, uh, usually they have grow this system in a very clean sample, so if you, you can really play with all the resistive curves. So here, what they have found is that at the point of a Dunlop singularity crossing, the deviation from 
no, his fear behavior, which is the form is the form liquid behavior. So what they observe here is that maybe there is a deviation of the t square behavior of the resistivity at the band of singularity point, which is really at the maximum of the electronic entropy is the largest. Also, there was a kind of electrocaloric determination of the eight RM of this system. Also, recently there was also huge softening of the Young's modulus of this system, which is somehow evidence that uh, this system's uh, lattice effect is somehow from somehow the induced from the electronic structure. Usually the, the way around is usually what you expect. Usually what you expect is a lattice drive the electronic effect, but in this case, you can see this is more like an electronic structure somehow drive the lattice effect in this system. And of course, there are a lot of studies which somehow uses this uniaxial uniac strain experiment for identify the properties of this system. But what we are interested in here is uh, this case. So this is uh, if, you, if you apply the uniaxial stress of one specific direction, what we observe is the uh, original this system has been a paramagnetic, so non-magnetically ordered one. But if you apply the pressure of one direction, eventually you will have a static order. In fact, this is quite uh, counterintuitive because usually when you think about the magnetically ordered system, if you apply the pressure, this system becomes more or less itinerant, and this itinerancy usually breaks the, the magnetic order. So usually when you have a magnetic order system, if you apply pressure, this system's the magnetic order is breaking down, but in this case, this is the other way around. Originally, this system is a paramagnetic, so non-magnetic order system, but eventually you will arrive at the magnetically order system if you apply the pressure upon one direction. So this was our question. Why the magnetism is stabilized under uniaxial stretch? For that, as I said, I performed the depth calculation with all this energetic. And here we included our lowest Q vector, which is corresponds to 0 0.3 and 0 0.3, and other suggested Q vectors too, one, one half and one fourth. And this is coming from a checkable type of the calcium lucinate. And also, according to our previous calculation, the uniaxial strain really affects the next nearest, the, not the longest nearest hopping. So we nearly consider one half zero and zero one half cases too. And we have a draw the energetic of this system. As we apply the uniaxial pressure, we can somehow map this into the pressure, and this is the evolution of the energetic curve upon the pressure. And what we have found is that even though we apply the pressure, the spin density wave, which, wave, which is lowest in energy, always remain the lowest in energy up to some point. This is the point where the Van Noppel singularity is really close, and after that, still spin density wave type of ordering always remains lowest. But another thing is that this is somehow as we expect, as we apply the pressure, the magnetic ordering tendency is uh, lowered. That means that the difference between number, the difference between zero and the spinach wave type is still getting closer and closer. Somehow, this means that the weakening of the spin density wave tendency of this system upon pressure. Another thing we have found is the local lucidity moment of this system it really varies a lot of a different Q vectors, which also somehow goes like this. So what we know from the moment behavior is that there's a strong variation of the moment from different Q values, which suggests the role of the very strong spin fluctuation of this system. We also study this system, so with the, because here we just state a few Q cases, now we say full Boolean, 2D Boolean zone with all these energetics in here. So if you see the energies in here, this is uh, the unstressed case, you can see the energies of the Q vector, spin density wave Q vector is always lowest in energy. And as we apply the pressure, this system, the Q vector, spin density wave Q vector, moves into the anisotropic direction up to here. So from here, what we have found is that spin density wave is always lowest in energy, but there's an anisotropic movement of this Q vector. There was a movement along this one half and one quarter direction, but still it remains as a the incoming rate. Here, so far, what we see is that, oh, spin density wave type of the magnetic interaction is uh, always lowest in energy, but it becomes weaker. So then why? 
why magnetic order appears for the spinless wave type K. Actually, in our calculation, spin fluctuation itself is not really included. So if you think about the total energy in terms of the simple magnetic order parameter, we can explain something like this. But if you uh, include the spin Moria, the Moria self-consistent normalization theory, where spin fluctuation can be included as a, the amplitude psi in the form of a B and C. So if you include the spin fluctuations in this uh, Hamiltonian magnetic order parameter, then this changes the B and C terms in here. Somehow the fluctuation try to reduce the spin susceptibility of this system, also decrease the average moment. Oh, the most important thing is it tried to suppress the long-range magnetic order parameter. In fact, this psi can be estimated from our Liang-Zhong fluctuation. So what we see here is again, first, the energetic show, curve shows that the spinach wave is always lowest in energy. But if you see the Liang zone of the, this is the magnetic moment curve. So actually this black area, dark area, is the, where the local moment does not survive. As we apply the pressure upon one direction, as you can see, the dark area becomes larger and larger. It means that even though spin density wave tendency is always remain the, the lowest in here, but the spin fluctuation itself is quite suppressed because we have phase space which spin fluctuation can survive is as large as this. But if we apply the pressure, all the spin moment is gone all, for all these dark areas, and the Phase space where spin fluctuation, spin fluctuation can survive is really shrink like this amount. And from here, we can estimate the, psi, the value of the spin fluctuation psi, and we can see it really changes a lot as we apply the pressure from one direction. So our interpretation, interpretation of this is something like this. So for the unstrained case, we can have an energetic curve something like this, and we have a magnetic, mean field magnetic ground state of here. If we add spin fluctuation of like this amount, the system goes into the uh, paramagnetic state where the magnetic order is not really stabilized in this system. For the case of strained case, actually there's a tendency towards magnetism itself is much smaller, but spin fluctuation itself becomes much more smaller. In that case, if this spin fluctuation cannot kill the magnetic uh, ground state of this system. So if we summarize for the unstrained case, so for the case of a paramagnetic case, we have a mean field calculation which is magnetic, but actually spin fluctuation, it kills the magnetism of this system. But for the strained case, actually the magnetic tendency itself becomes much more smaller. But actually spin fluctuation is suppressed, which is even much more strongly suppressed, and it cannot really kill the magnetism, which is even smaller than previous case, so and the static magnetism survive. So actually the corollary of this uh, case is that if we apply the much more stress of one direction, eventually I think the magnetic tendency becomes, uh, now it really cannot survive in this case, and eventually this system will again fall into the paramagnetic phase uh, upon even, even more stronger strain case. Okay, so this is the overall summary of my work. So, so essentially, originally the system itself is paramagnetic, but if we apply the pressure, the magnetic tendency becomes much more smaller. But spin fluctuation, which originally kills the magnetism of this system, but this spin fluctuation is much more strongly suppressed, and it really cannot kill the magnetism of this system. And for the case of the strain case, the magnetism survive. So with this, I want to thank all my collaborators in here, which I've been working with Cesare, Sergei, and Igor, who was really essential, and some colleagues in Korea, and to you for remaining until very late. Thank you.